Hey, good afternoon and welcome to the College of Optical Sciences uh, Colloquium Lecture Series. Uh, today we're very lucky to have our own Jerry Maloney here talking to us about the semiconductor disk laser. Uh, professor Maloney is a professor both in mathematics and optical sciences here at the University of Arizona and he's been spending most of his time in this building since about 2009, 2010, something like that? Uh, yeah, but earlier. Yeah, he's, well, if you look at his CV, he's been around for a long time, but I think we, we got him to plant roots officially a few years back. Um, he did his bachelor's degree in Ireland and his PhD in chemical physics at the University of Western Ontario. Um, and his uh, research area is in space-time complexity and passive and active nonlinear optical systems. Um, he's doing work in terahertz and optics, and he's going to talk today about semiconductor disk laser. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Scott. Actually, I've got to update that thing. <laughs> I've moved on a lot, actually, from them, but at least... Um... So, um, actually, when I was here, I guess in 2010, I gave a colloquium on um, femtosecond, ultra-fast ultra femtosecond light string propagation in the atmosphere. So this is actually this is a, new t a different topic, not new. Uh, but um, it's something we've been involved in actually here for, since 2002. Uh, the semiconductor disk laser, I chose that title because um, there are solid state disk lasers which are currently probably the brightest, highest power uh, laser devices out there at present. Uh, in fact, uh, they can be scaled up to multiple kilowatts, 100 kilowatt class lasers consist of, they're, typically they're glass, glasses, transparent glasses, with dopants added to the glasses, and the, the lacing transitions, of course, happen in the dopants. So these, th these doped uh, glasses are typically constrained to wavelengths at which there are lacing transitions in the, in the dopant materials. On the other hand, semiconductors have the property that you can really tune the wavelength to pretty well any target wavelength in the IR and potentially in the mid-IR, maybe up to at least four or five microns. <coughs> so, um, of course, this thing doesn't work. The laser works, but oh, I know why it doesn't work. Slight technical hitch. <laughs> Let's see if it works now. That works? Oh. So what I'm actually really going to talk about is um, a project which was funded for five years by the Joint Technology Office, um, managed by Air Force R. Um, this was a multidisciplinary research initiative which uh, started in 2007 and actually ended mid-August of last year. Uh, so basically, high-power laser using optically pumped semiconductor laser concepts. Uh, the lead institution was the University of Arizona, and many of the names on here are very recognizable. Um, various faculty here at OSC. Uh, Stefan Koch, who's got a split position, he's in Marburg and at Optical Sciences. Uh, Yushi Kaneda is familiar to people, I'm sure. Mike Yarbrough, Alexander Larong is a postdoc, and Mike Scheller is uh, an assistant research professor. And various students have been in, involved in this project along the way. Now, the goal of the project actually was to try to develop these uh, semiconductor disk lasers into high brightness sources at wavelengths that uh, in the w around one micron. These are gallium arsenide based structures, but also at longer wavelengths in the mid IR starting at two microns. And these are structures that are grown on gallium and timonide, so it's a different material system. Uh, the University of New Mexico group uh, actually uh, grow gallium and timonide materials, so they gr were growing our designs. And the University of Marburg with Wolfgang Stolz were actually growing the gallium arsenide based uh, uh, disc, semiconductor disc or OPSL materials. Uh, the designs actually were actually uh, done by nonlinear control strategies which is a small company, and Jörg Hatter actually was the key, and Jörg is the expert in this field. Jörg actually has an appointment here, but I've put him here because he was paid on this project through his company affiliation. So, so anyhow, what I'll do is I'll start with an introduction, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to take you from the, the very beginning, in other words, the fundamental physics, the issues with the fundamental physics, all the way through to design, growth of the wafers, processing, and finally, the production of the end uh, high-power laser product. Uh, so the first part, I'll just run through a brief introduction. Uh, the history of this laser um, is also called a vertical external cavity surface emitting laser, VEXEL, or an optically pumped semiconductor laser, an OPSL. And Coherent and Santa Clara prefer to use this OPSL uh, description. Uh, 
basically, to my knowledge, the very first patent on the structure was back in 1989 by Steve Bruick, John McInerney, and others up at the University of New Mexico. But everybody seems to have conveniently forgotten about it because Kuznetsov actually gets all the credit 10 years later. And Kuznetsov in 1999 with Meridian actually published a paper on a less than one watt output from a Vexel structure. Um, and this, in fact, they patented it. The patent was actually assumed by Coherent. And then Coherent put out a string of pat patents, patents between 2001 and 2004. What they were primarily protecting was what they called intercavity second harmonic generation. And, and I'll show you, in fact, how that works. Um, way back in 2002, uh, this was the first JTO MRI I got, which actually was on phosphate doped glasses. But uh, I was able to convince JTO to... Um, seed fund uh, the initial studies of these vexel structures, these semiconductor structures. To my knowledge, we're the only group in the United States that are funded in an academic setting to do research on these. On the other hand, in Europe, there are multiple groups in all different countries have been funded over the year. Uh, the, the Europeans love uh, acronyms. If you can create a really good acronym, you get a lot of money. <laughs> so they've got some interesting acronyms here. And then the actual funding that I'm going to describe here primarily started in 2007. Uh, just, I'm not going to talk about this at any length, but it gives you an idea. Coherence, Opsil-based products. So essentially they've got the so-called Gen Genesis series, uh, Verde series. The Verde series effectively is 532 nanometer, different power levels. Tracer, if you look at these guys, you can see lots of different wavelengths, different power levels. And these are typically all high brightness sources. And in fact, they've got the so-called Sapphire Obis laser system. So they're developing a lot of products based on these on this uh, OPSL concept, but they are very paranoid about protecting their patents, which is probably the reason why no other companies are actually pursuing this technology. Um, this is actually a very nice slide I got from Jennifer Hasty at the Institute of Photonics in Strathclyde. This actually shows the wavelength span of these vexel or OPSL structures or disk structures. So they run, this is all direct transitions. And you can generate second harmonics of these in principle or higher harmon or more subharmonics. So it starts around 670 nanometers and goes all the way up to about 5 microns. And uh, the one notable result actually is a result by our, our group here, which is the highest ever power out of a single chip. That's 100 watts out of a single chip. It was actually published by our German collaborators and by uh, Amy Wang within a month of one another. So, um, <clears throat> so here's the actual uh, optical disk laser, uh, the sort of semiconductor disk laser. So it consists of a Bragg grating, a Bragg mirror, high reflectivity Bragg mirror, a stack of quantum wells that are arranged in a periodic arrangement inside in this piece of semiconductor material. The entire structure ends up to be about six microns thick. So it's a very, very thin structure. You need a lot, you need a lot of quantum wells in here because you want the single pass gain to exceed the losses so that you can actually set up a laser oscillation. So the idea is you come in with your pump laser, which is typically a broad area fiber, uh, coupled uh, diode laser. Uh, the nice thing about the pump laser is that you, the target wavelength is not significant. It can be all over the place because if you pump into the barriers, you get an extremely broad absorption barriers, so you don't have to temperature stabilize the pump wavelength. So what you effectively do is you take incoherent diode bar light and convert it into highly coherent emission at, a, at another wavelength. So here, for example, you might be using 808 nanometers pump and you're extracting, let's say, 1040 nanometers um, in the lasing emission. Um, people actually have built electrically pumped vessels, which I would um, not advise one to do. They're obviously very, very complicated, but they introduce lots of additional losses because you've got op now you have to dope the Bragg mirror. They even have to introduce another Bragg on top so that they can actually dope it so they can have an N and P dope region. So there are very large optical losses because of the dopants. And additionally, you get dual heating. And heating is really bad for these structures. So you've got an additional source of heating. But anyhow, the, uh, the FAST dot European consortium recently reported about 100 milliwatts out of one of these electrically pumped structures. And the Novolux, the company that is no more, um, actually did have a Nexel, which is the electrically pumped version of this, which gave out about one watt of light. Okay, so we're back. I'm going to talk about optical pumping. And um, so we're coming in with a pump laser, and there's two, there's two options to pump these devices. This is a sort of schematic of the barrier region and the embedded quantum well. Uh, 
So, for example, you can pump. This is the pump photon. If you pump into the barrier, you create, of course, then the, the, uh, the carriers have got to uh, get captured in the quantum well, cascade down, and then emit, combined with the, um, the uh, what do you call it, <laughs> the holes, uh, to, to emit a photon, right? Uh, this actually is the most uh, efficient in the sense that you absorb, you, you essentially absorb about 80% of the pump light in a single pass through this very thin structure. Uh, the problem is that, of course, there's a, very there's a very large quantum defect between the energy of the incoming pump photon and the emitted photon. And all of that goes into heat. That additional uh, energy goes into heat. So thermal management is a major pro problem with barrier pumping. Um, so then you obviously say, OK, let's go ahead and just pump the quantum wells. Uh, this actually looks like a traditional three-level system, atomic system. When you pump the quantum wells, obviously you're your quantum defect is very low, so you don't have a heat issue. But of course, there's always a problem, a conservation of difficulty. The absorption per pass here might be about 5% of the pump light. So you have to somehow recirculate the pump light many times through the structure to get en enough absorption. Um, and that's actually not trivial to do. In fact, now you've got two standing waves. You've got your pump wave and your um, emitting wavelength simultaneously. And you need, you need to start putting the quantum wells where these waves actually overlap in the structure. So for the most, essentially all that I'm going to describe will be barrier, barrier pump structures. Now the, the well pump structure actually is the closest analog of the thin disk solid state laser. This, as I said, if you, if you cascade lots of these lasers together, you can get up to multi-kilowatt level powers. These are typically 100, 200 microns thick. So they're much, much thicker than they are opsal chips. Um, the idea with making it very thin is you're trying to avoid thermal lensing, which you get at very high powers. Because then you get a thermal distortion of the beam. Uh, disadvantages as you, you have to do multiple pass absorption. And here's an example. This is the actual doped, uh, crystal, single, uh, your little doped uh, disc. So what you have to do is you have to recycle the pump multiple times with this parabolic mirror and extract the light in this direction. Uh, so that's a problem, uh, s similar problem that with, the, with the quantum well pumping, for example. And there are wavelength restrictions because you can only laze where the dopants allow you to laze. And of course, and these dopants typically have fairly narrow absorption lines, so you have to stabilize the pump, your pump laser. So now this is actually a beautiful uh, diagram that uh, Alexander Laurent produced. And it's actually a very realistic schematic of the actual of a laser, of a dopsel. The semiconductor chip is sitting on here. Uh, there's a mirror here. This is a so-called V cavity. And the light is extracted out through this um, uh, output coupler. And it's pumped here with a fiber coupled, uh, with a fiber uh, coupled 808 nanometer pump. Now, in this particular setting, we actually designed, and I'll talk about the design. We designed the chip to wave around at 10, to laser 1020 nanometers. But now the very nice thing about this geometry is you can just put a HR mirror back on here, put an LBO crystal in the cavity, and intracavity uh, you can generate 510 um, five, nanometers, multi-watt powers at 510 nanometers. Um, we also actually um, designed the chip to laser at 1178. And again, with the LBO crystal in the cavity, L that's 589, which is a sodium line. And at the time, a number of years ago, back in 2007, actually, we proposed this as a guide star in a shoebox. It hasn't been mounted on any telescope yet, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a very compact source of, um, we got about 5 watts um, of uh, 589 nan nanometers out of this chip. Um, you can then take the output of this guy and double it again in an LBO crystal. And there's a publication by Yushi Kaneda and various members of the group on that where you generate 295 in the UV. Um, then even early on, we actually designed the chip at 976 nanometers, generates 488. And then with 488, you can down, I could down convert to 244 nanometers in the UV. So it's tremendous flexibility in these devices. You can get the direct lasing transition. And then through intercavity generation, you can actually generate all of these. You can go into the visible and down into the UV. Um, Jason Jones group actually. Um, have used these vexel chips in this kind of a geometry where you go through a dub two sequences of doublings. So he started off at 1014 down to 507 and needed 254 for to correspond with the transition in mercury. 
And uh, this was actually successfully used in actually building a mercury trap, again using these vessels. Um, the very nice spin-off of this is, as I said, you can do intracavity optics uh, by putting a um, nonlinear crystal, this piplin crystal, in the cavity. Um, we were able to demonstrate, in fact, that you can extract terahertz, and actually lots of terahertz power for terahertz, about 2 milliwatts at 1.9 terahertz of power at room temperature. And this device is highly tunable. You, the etalon, actually, this little thin 100 micron etalon, defines the IR. You, you run dual wavelengths in the cavity whose separation corresponds to the terahertz power, and then you use the crystal to do fre de uh, frequency differ uh, difference frequency generation. Um, you can replace the quantum wells by quantum dots, and this was actually done by the group at UNM. And again, their generated wavelengths in the 1200, 1300 nanometer wave, and again, about five watts of output power. It's just pretty, this is a, an oscillator, a single oscillator. Uh, so now let me talk a little bit about how we design these chips. Uh, so this is a schematic. Uh, there's different levels of optimization. Before we ever get to growing a wafer and cleaving it and mounting it and etching, uh, the first thing we have to do is we need to optimize the quantum wells. We need to optimally design the quantum wells so they'll emit, emit maximally at the target wavelength. So what we essentially do, and this is actually done through the small company nonlinear control strategies, is one uses this full quantum de design strategy, which I'll briefly sketch shortly. Uh, the idea is at the wafer level, if you grow a wafer, you can actually measure photoluminescence. So basically, you take your laser, you shine a weak light source on it, and uh, increase the intensity of the light source, and me measure the spontaneous emission. The photoluminescence spectrum at different illumination intensities gives us enough uh, information to tell the grower whether they've correctly grown the device, or whether they're inaccurate in their growth, or whether they have problems in their growth. So at this stage, we can directly feed back to the grower and tell them they're right or they're, they're on, they're off. Uh, then at the next level, so we have to optimize the quantum, which is a many quantum many-body problem. We now have to do a sort of a structural optimization. So here is a schematic of the structure. We have the resonant periodic gain structure with a stack of quantum wells. The little blue lines, they're more obvious here. So what, we need to be able to align the standing wave. This is a, this is a sub-cavity, a micro-cavity, about two microns thick. So we have to align the quantum wells uh, with the standing wave, the antinodes of the standing wave field in the structure, what this does is it actually resonantly enhances the, the intrinsic gain. So we get additional gain over and above the gain of the individual quantum well. And this is called resonant periodic gain. So we get a gain enhancement. The problem is that in a laser structure, when you pump the structure, it heats up. So in fact, this is actually a full thermal, 3D thermal analysis, and the red means hot. So where the quantum wells are, where we're absorbing all the light, we're, we're generating lots of heat. This heat will, in fact, shift the, the it'll, by changing the refractive index of the structure, will actually shift the microcavity resonance. And what's interesting is the gain also shifts with temperature. It shifts much faster with temperature. So the key to this design is to be able to anticipate the temperature of the end running device and design it before you actually send it off for growth. And then we send it off to the University of New Mexico or Marburg or wherever to actually grow the actual wafers. Um, here's sort of an example, of, and one of the issues is these are the input-output curves for a, a typical vexel structure. So we're op this is the optical pump. This is the, um, actually this is the output power. And this shows, in fact, that there's a very strong wavelength shift as we go from threshold all the way up to this rollover point. So what happens in these devices is as you pump them harder and harder, you arrange for the, the absorption peak to be much shorter than the microcavity resonance because you know when you pump it, things start shifting to longer wavelength. They're shifting at different rates. So the microcavity resonance is moving slowly. This guy is moving fast. When the gain peak catches up with the resonance, you get the maximum output power, and then it crosses that resonance, and the device shuts off. And this is called thermal shutoff. So ideally, what you'd like to do is uh, push this to as high a power as possible before thermal shutoff. OK, some uh, physics and background here. As I said, and I never really talk about this in most meetings, but the key here is this quantum design. Uh, what we can actually do is this is, a, as I said, the semiconductor medium. This is a simple two-band model uh, described by what are known as the, the, semiconductor, the semiconductor block equations. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, these have to be coupled to Maxwell's equation if we're describing a laser. But for now, let's just focus on the semiconductor block equations. So essentially what's happening here, this is a many-body system because we create multiple electrons and multiple holes. In the, we've got the conduction and valence band. And the, polar, the induced polarizations, coherences are between uh, individual electron hole pairs. These interact through Coulomb interactions, Coulomb repulsions, Coulomb att attractions. Now these equations, if you've seen the optical block equations for a two-level system, they're written to look very simple. Uh, this guy here for the, is the polarization at a momentum K. You've got the energy gap, the energy difference between the electrons and holes, that's the band gap. Uh, this, in fact, is the inversion. Uh, this capital omega here is a so-called rabbi frequency. So this, in fact, is the polarization dynamics uh, for ind an individual momentum. And you also have the population inversions, which now are distribution functions, uh, these F sub Ks for electrons and holes. Now, we know that there are many body effects, and everybody quotes this. Uh, if you look at this equation and look at the rabbi frequency, you find that it's not just the bare um, electric field that's uh, incident on the system as it would be in a two-level atom. It's actually renormalized by these Coulomb interactions. So what actually happens is the rabbi frequency is actually modified once you start generating excited carriers and holes. Uh, and also, of course, the energy is renormalized. So what actually happens is you get this band gap renormalization. The band gap shift is actually shrinks. Now, if this was the whole story, uh, this would be a relatively straightforward problem. What people usually do with the optical block equations, and actually with these equations also, is they say, well, these correlation terms, let's re replace this guy by uh, a 1 over T2 times P sub K. We assume that the system is uh, relaxing to an irreversible heat bath. And similarly here, by a, a time constant, 1 over T t times F sub K. If you do that, you're completely off in, in calculating the gain how to get the, the gain peak, the magnitude of the gain, the gain shift or temperature or carrier densities. So in other words, you have to parameterize your model to fit to, you have to have the experiment to, see, to tweak your parameters. The idea here is we don't want to tweak those parameters. We have to get one-on-one -on -one agreement with the experiments. Uh, just to give you um, uh, a taste of the complexity, and uh, if you ever want to talk to Jörg Hader, he'll give you all the gory details. Uh, this many-body problem is, is actually very, very complicated. Uh, the, these correlation terms actually consist of two types of interactions. The Coulomb term here is the carrier-carrier um, and whole-whole um, scattering. Uh, these are essentially energy-conserving terms. And you also have phonons scattering with the phonons. So if you think of this little diagram here, this is the, um, the conduction band. The carriers that are excited into the top of the conduction band have to sort of drop down to the base of the conduction band, and then they recombine with their paired um, guy down on the other band <laughs> and emit, emit photons. Now, these interactions are extremely fast. They happen, this intraband scattering happens on time scales of 10 to 100 femtoseconds. But, of course, this structure doesn't have a single band. It's got multiple bands. I showed that you've got these confined states in the quantum wells. So, actually, you have these uh, carriers also have to scatter from these various subbands down to the lowest subband. Inter-subband scattering typically takes on the order of a picosecond. And then you get to the point where your laser action is going to start, spontaneous emission. So initially you get spontaneous emission and then stimulated emission. And this typically happens on a nanosecond time scale. At the same time, you get this OJ uh, losses, OJ recombination, which happened on the same time scale of the order of nanoseconds. And then much, much slower, you get this classical thermal heat transport. So it's a vast separation of scales of all of these processes. And these can be bottlenecks if you're trying to generate a really short pulse, for example. Okay, so here's a summary of the, um, the, the way this... There's actually a uh, nonlinear control strategy has a simulated software, which actually allows one to design, uh, optimize these. This is the, um, the, the quantum well barrier structure. So these are the... You compute the, the wafer uh, photoluminescence, and the, the experimental data here are the dots and the solid lines are, are the theory, and we're not allowed to adjust parameters as we change the... They sit on top of one another. We make one adjustment that for one reference point, and then everything... If you now change the intensity of your illuminating source, you change that, and the data sits on top of each other. This is the gain. Again, in this actual case, we actually calculated the gain before we sent the chip away to get, do the gain measurement. So again, this is a, an unusual example where the, the experiment agrees with the theory. Uh, 
we also can calculate from first principles of spontaneous emission and the OJ losses. So these are all key inputs to the behavior of a, of a laser. Uh, the spontaneous emission, for example, um, laser thresholds around this point, the expected spontaneous emission should go as uh, a constant times the carrier density squared, which would be the straight line. This guy is divided by N. And you can see here there's radical departure. Once you go past laser threshold, there's radical departure of the spontaneous losses and the OJ losses from the textbook kind of formulas. Another very important um, uh, way of characterizing these chips is to measure what's called the TDR, time-dependent reflectivity. And this actually is a very simple process. What you do is you put the chip on a hot plate and you just heat up the hot plate. And um, here, for example, at room temperature, uh, this actually is the stop band. So what we have is a Bragg structure at a very short cavity. So we'd expect to see a stop band where if there were no quantum wells in the structure, the reflectivity would be 99.99%. But because there are actually quantum wells embedded in the structure, you get an absorption dip. So if you actually shine a broadband light source on this guy to get the spectrum, you see a little dip in the corresponding to the quantum wells. There's actually two dips in here. One is the so-called photoluminescence peak or absorption peak, and the other one is the subcavity resonance. Now, as I said, as you just put this on a hot plate and heat it from 22 degrees, I guess, up to 100 degrees, you find that the absorption peak is shifting and the microcavity resonance are shifting, and they catch up at 100 degrees, and you get this really sharp, resonantly enhanced absorption dip. So now if you think of this as a laser, rather than putting it in a hot plate, you're pumping it with a diode bar. It's heating up internally. What's going to happen here is this guy will actually transition from absorption to gain. So you're going to end up with a reflectivity where the reflectivity is greater than 1. So essentially the opsal chip acts like an active mirror, effectively. It's an amplifying mirror in your, in your two-mirror cavity. Um, another a very important uh, experimental measurement that verifies, in fact, the accuracy of the growth of the structure is the, um, the photoluminescence. I showed you the intrinsic material photoluminescence, and here's the green curve here is another graph of that. But actually, if you look at the photoluminescence through the top of the chip, uh, you have this uh, complex structure, so you have to multiply that with a filter function or the transfer function for the device. So the actual experimentally measured uh, photoluminescence spectrum has, a lot of, has some substructure in it. Again, the experiment is that noisy looking curve and the calculation is the is a solid curve. And again, we just go ahead and heat it up and measure the, uh, photo, the surface photoluminescence at elevated temperature. And again, the experiment and theory lie right on top of one another. Okay, now let me talk. So the point here is that we have, rather than just doing post-mortem analysis where you build your laser and then you know the key, everybody knows the physics and you throw in enough parameters that you can actually you can get it to agree and you feel good about it, that you're now understanding the physics. Our approach is to try to minimize the parameters. You can't take every parameter out of the system, but you can actually minimize the parameters and actually make much more quantitative studies and actually design much better lasers. So now let me talk about the growth and processing challenges, because these are, I've learned a lot by being the PI, by being the PI on this project. Um, this structure has a lot of interfaces. Essentially, the, the relevant part is the resonant periodic gain structure on top with the quantum wells, the Bragg mirror. Now, what we have to do is we metallize it, so we have Thai gold or chrom Thai chromium, indium, six microns of indium. We actually mount this on CBD diamond because CBD diamond is a very effective heat spreader. And then we bond that directly to a co copper submount, which is typically water-cooled. Now, one of the big issues, one, well, of the many issues, and back in the early days, we had real problems with this. Uh, when you bond with indium, uh, this thing loves to, to create voids, air, air gaps in the indium. If there are any voids in the indium and you pump the sky hard, the thing just melts. It just burns up. Uh, here's a sonar scan, which is an acoustic image of that indium layer. So what we've now been doing in the past is this recently is vacuum bonding you can basically show that this thing is free of solder voids. So we've come up with a process which actually, by making it free of solder voids, we can now pump this chip much, much harder than we could before. Um, now, there are two ways of processing these chips. They're like the hard way and the easy way. Well, the, the less hard way, I should say. Uh, bottom emitter, a bottom emitter structure sounds really strange. We actually grow the structure upside down. So we have a gallium arsenide substrate, we grow the quantum wells first and the Bragg mirror second. 
And so now what we have, we have to do a lot of processing of this chip. So the first thing we do is we metallize. So we metallize a Thai gold, for example. Then we essentially just flip chip bond. We flip it over. And we have to also metallize the diamond. And this is the indium on the diamond. So now this is actually bonded in a partial vacuum system. And the last step, there's about five or 600 microns of gallium arsenide substrate on here. Uh, we have to completely actuate the, the substrate. There are lots of challenges here. You want to make sure your etch, sorry, stops. <laughs> and some of us had a few accidents where literally they etched away the entire device chip, but we won't, I won't point any fingers. <laughs> but the idea here is the cap, this cap layer typically act, acts as an etch stop layer. Uh, so this is the bottom. This actually is the thinnest structure you can process, but it's actually challenging to grow. And this is the structure that was grown by the group at Marburg. The other option, the top emitter, which was grown on the gallium antimonide material at the for better people at UNM, we just grow a traditional structure. Uh, again, we don't want, we want to get rid of the substrate, so we, um, we lap off some of the substrate, and then we mount it. Uh, the heat is still flowing through the DBR, and now it has to flow through 100 microns of gallium arsenide. So in fact, as a final step, we uh, add an, an, a transparent single crystal diamond to try to take the heat out of top. Now this might look like the most efficient way because the diamond heat spreader is closest to the, the hot region of the chip, uh, but this is a real problem. You actually you have to contact us with the heat sink, and all of the devices that have performed the highest power so far are bottom emitter devices. So even though this looks very attractive, of course you've also got this intercavity diamond to deal with also, because so you're... Okay, so this is the actual reactor at, um, at the University of Marburg. And this was actually um, uh, a full production reactor with um, gross 12 uh, four inch wafers, 12 four inch wafers. At the University of New Mexico, we have a mid IR uh, growing these gallium antimonide structures. Um, they have actually a very interesting growth mode, which I would normally talk about, but I may not have a lot of time to talk about here. One of the big deals with any kind of semiconductor growth is you want, you, you need a substrate that has a lattice constant that's as close as possible to the whatever you're trying to grow on it, right? So um, that, that restricts what you can grow and on, on what substrate. But actually here, this is a very, here you can have a very strong lattice mismatch growth essentially across a single atomic layer. This is called interfacial misfit dislocation arrays. And we actually did grow a structure, a vexel structure, a mid-IR vexel structure with this layer. And there were issues with it, but actually we got a record pulsed output from that device. But this actually could solve, if, if it worked, could really solve this lattice mismatch problem. Okay, success stories. So what, what do we do with all this stuff? <clears throat> okay, so first of all, um, this actually was Amy Wang's, um, Amy who graduated last August. Um, Amy's experiment. So basically this is, the idea here was we wanted to tr see if we could extract the maximum power from one of these chips. Vexel chip is here, it's pumped by two actually 200 watt 808 nanometer pumps and it's a linear cavity and then a 4% 5% um, transmission. So the idea here is the, this is the actual, these pump diode, la the, the fibers are typically, this Apollo laser has a 200 micron diameter fiber. So this is a multi-mode fiber, like it's not a single mode fiber, very highly multi-mode. And actually we had another pump from DLAS, uh, which was a 400 micron fiber. And this guy had a very strange peak in the middle, which is very bad, because that means that if you pump with that guy, the center of the chip will heat up, it'll shut off in the center. So uh, the people at DLAS said, oh, just twist it. There's 200 watts coming out of this thing. So Amy was very reluctant to sort of wind it around in a loop, but they said, go ahead, no problem. And we actually, it was their, it was their laser, they loaned it to us, so uh, we didn't have a lot to lose. So actually it looks much better when you bend the fiber. And uh, this was the actual setup to pump. Now in this particular device, after you know five years of a project, we realized that, again, this is the TDR, that way of figuring out if the growth is correct or not. We wanted to actually move the, um, the absorption peak further away from the microcavity resonance such that we have to pump it harder so the threshold goes up, but we also anticipate that the slope, uh, the slope also um, increases dramatically. So this was a, what we call a large tuning device. Now one thing I didn't mention is the nice thing about these chips is if you increase the pump spot radius, you should be able to scale the power up uh, by a factor, actually it goes as R squared, the power scaling. 
So by at a 750 micron pump spot, uh, got up to about 60 watts, up to 800 micros, well, 100 watts, and actually uh, cooling down to zero degrees centigrade, we got over 100 watts out of a single chip, which was actually a result that uh, was published last year. Um, one month earlier, our collaborators in Marburg, uh, Amy had the misfortune that the Apollo laser died, and she had to send it back to get it fixed. So uh, Bernd Hein in, in, um, in um, Marburg actually had a, was a step ahead of her. They had a 400-watt laser. They actually also exceeded 100 watts from a single chip. And they did something very interesting. The cap layer on that device, by etching down the cap layer, they could control the wavelength. So they shifted the wavelength from 1035 down to 1028 nanometers. So there's a lot of flexibility in controlling the wavelength on these devices. Um, thanks to Mike Yarbrough, who's sitting up there. Mike uh, has lots of contacts uh, in the business world. That's the advantage of being around for a long time. <laughs> um, Mike actually found some cronies of his who had gave him an old dermatology laser that was dead. And um, so we got the Alexandrite rod, and it was flash lamp pumped. This produced about 800 nanosecond pulses with peak powers on the order of a kilowatt or a few kilowatts. It's not a very nice uh, laser system, as Mike will attest to. But actually, this was used to pulse pump these 1040 nanometer chips. And I should, the, the actual flash lamp, the power supply was, was applied by Applied Energetics, who I think are still around in Tucson. They closed last week. They closed last week. Okay, well, it wasn't our fault. <laughs> uh, and so basically, uh, we, we got a peak power. The pulses, as I said, were about 800 um, nanoseconds, a 400 watt peak power, which is pretty good. And the chip, the, the chip held up, actually, for at, at, at that kind of power. Okay, so let me move along here. Um, more recently, uh, Alexander Laurent has, we're, we're trying to get a single frequency oscillator, high power single frequency oscillator. So this is actually a set up a V cavity uh, with a birefringent filter in there. So um, Alexander's managed to get up to 15 watts of uh, single frequency output from a, a chip at uh, 1020 nanometers. And uh, this actually does mode hop and he's working now on um, trying to use an external locking cavity to stabilize the but actually, 15 watts from an oscillator is quite remarkable. Most fibers that I know need to amplify stages to boost up the, um, the single mode power. So this is single frequency. Uh, if you put, again, what he put the LBO crystal in the cavity, he generates a second harmonic at 510. And again, this is pretty stable, but needs further stabilization. Uh, Mike Scheller, um, the obvious thing people have been, is to see if we could mode lock this guy. So basically, replacing one of the mirrors by a CSAM, a saturable absorber, um, Mike was actually able to, to mode lock this guy with pulses of duration just less than 700 femtoseconds, 1.7 gigahertz rep rate, uh, 5.1 watt average power, which is actually very high average power. And coincidentally, when we were publishing this paper, there was a very nice um, review paper by Wilson Sibbett in, uh, in, not in, in St. Andrews, where they were publishing all the average power data for mode-locked laser, mode locked lasers. And so Mike's results sits here. So this is a log scale. So this was actually a pretty dramatic improvement on the average power. And the peak power around 3 kilowatts. Uh, the 2 micron uh, device, I've been talking now about the 1 micron bottom emitters primarily. The top emitter essentially is this thing where we have to put a diamond on top. And this is Yi Ying worked on this project along with uh, Mike and others. And we did manage to get 3 watts CW out of this device, which is as good as the best that people have gotten out of these gallium antimonide material systems. And again, we actually did pulse pump it. This, this chip actually was this, uh, had the IMF growth, this very strange lattice mismatch growth mode. And um, we pumped it again, but now with a YAG, uh, oscillator amplifier chain, the pulses were 100, 160 nanoseconds in duration. And this is the progression from 8 watts to 70 watts to... 400 watts over about three years. So again, this was the peak power in these two micron uh, devices. Um, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not doing too badly, actually. I was getting worried about the time. Uh, future challenges. Obviously, uh, we've gotten to a certain point. The many-body theory that I mentioned that's actually now a software package assumes what's known as quasi-equilibrium. So the, uh, the assumption is that the carriers are in even though they're hot carriers, they're in Fermi distributions, even if they're hot or cold or whatever. Uh, but actually, the, um, if you drive 
these chips hard, or if you want to generate multiple wavelengths, as we, as I mentioned, for terahertz generation, um, you're going to generate these. Ca these carriers are going to be driven far from equilibrium. And let me just give you a few. Uh, back to this slide again. Um, so basically, as I said, when I, these are the terms that are in the optical block equations. They're sort of trivial. They're, uh, they're these, these irreversible relaxation terms. Here, these involve very, very fast coherent dynamics on femtosecond time scales. So they, can't be, they cannot be report, replaced by a damping coefficient. Uh, the, the, you have to calculate these full many body terms. There, this is a huge calculational project. But in effect, uh, the reason why you need to do this is illustrated here. Uh, this is actually is a graph of the um, electron density as a function of electron momentum, normalized to the Bohr momentum. The usual Fermi distribution is this red curve. But now if you actually come along, you, you pump, we we'll say, the upper level of a quantum well really hard. So you're dumping in hot carriers in here. Uh, these hot carriers, through scattering with phonons, are going to cascade down to the bottom of the conduction band, and the holes are going in the other direction. And so you're going to end up here with cold carriers that are taken out of the lasing wavelength. So essentially what you have is a transition of momentum from high momentum down to the momentum at which the, the, the stimulated emission happens, the carriers are taken out. And this is called a kinetic hole. And it's not a spectral hole. Now, the actual gain, on the other hand, the gain actually, when you calculate a gain curve, you integrate over this, these momenta. And the, the corresponding gains don't show any spectral holes or holes in the distributions. There are very subtle changes in the gain, maybe it's flattening or whatever, which actually does profoundly affect the dynamics or stability of the laser, but this actually is occurring or reflected properly in the, in the carrier distributions, these kinetic hole burnings. Um, and here, in fact, this is a sort of a nice schematic showing, um, again, this is the graph of the, uh, the occupation probability for the, this is the kinetic hole burning, and uh, there's too many holes here, there's the electrons and the holes. This is the electron dist distribution, this is the hole distribution. So when we generate that terahertz signal, for example, the nice thing about a semiconductor is that you don't, the, the device necessarily isn't going to try and run at the maximum of the gain. You can enforce, you can burn holes, as I showed there, at any arbitrary wavelength in those distributions. So by putting a very thin etalon into the cavity, that etalon will have a prescribed, uh, will support modes, we'll say, with a six, seven nanometer spacing. You can force those wavelengths to run and amplifying the semiconductor laser. So in the f what actually happens here is by putting a thin etalon into the cavity, you, you're simultaneously running on two separate wavelengths. And this separate wavelength we actually used with this nonlinear crystal to do difference frequency generation and generate our terahertz beam. If you simply tilt the etalon in the cavity, you can actually tune the, the terahertz of the space. So these are non-equilibrium, these are significant non-equilibrium processes where you're getting strong departures from these usual Fermi distributions. Now, if you're going to generate the ultimate shortest pulse possible in a semiconductor material, uh, currently uh, vexels are down to about 200 femtoseconds uh, mode locked. Uh, that was reported in uh, Photonics West in, in January. If you want to go sub 100 femtoseconds, you're going to deal with issues where the carriers are never going to be in a, in a Fermi distribution. The carriers are still, can, can never equilibrate locally. Uh, this is a pretty extreme example of a passive semiconductor that where the carriers are injected in here and it takes, this thing actually takes about five picoseconds to, to equilibrate to a Fermi distribution. In a mode locked laser, you'd typically be, because you're pumping it continuously, you'd be close to Fermi distribution, but then you'd be burning uh, these kinetic holes, dynamic kinetic holes in the, in the distributions. So the reason, um, and now if you go to the other extreme, and I'll ask what if we go back to electrically pumped structures with multiple quantum wells. Now you've got the problem of you've got this um, transport of electrons from the contact and holes uh, in a multiple quantum well structure. The question is, what's the end uh, population of electrons and holes in, in these individual quantum wells? Do you get an excess of electrons in the, these guys and less excess of holes here? So do you get a very strong space charge effect? Um, the reason I'm putting these up is we're just writing a proposal to get funded to do this work. But actually, non-equilibrium effects are, are really what are currently limiting how short a pulse you can generate out of these semiconductor active structures. 
And one of the ways we're proposing to look at it is to handle the transport through the, all the interfaces of the header structure by classical means and then actually couple this model to the full microscopic many-body term once we get into the excited barrier states and down into the quantum wells. So that's something we're hoping to be able to do over the next three or four years. So conclusion. Um, so basically, um, by designing this quantum design, uh, which uh, basically is, as I said, is a quasi-equilibrium microscopic many-body theory, with the structural engineering, the thermal analysis, we've actually managed to produce um, record powers from a single chip. In fact, we've produced all the powers. Uh, I think coherent were at 30 watts. So we've gone from 30 to 40 to 60 to 100. Um, also, rec and in fact, these chips can be scaled. You can put multiple chips in a cavity, which was shown many years ago, in fact, with some work with Lee Fan and Mahmood. If you put two chips in the cavity, the power scales up by a factor of two. So you can actually, you could potentially cascade these chips to get up to kilowatt level powers. Uh, we've demonstrated record average and peak powers in these uh, sub picosecond mode lock pulses. And indeed, with the gallium antimonide structures with this lattice mismatch IMF layer, we actually did demonstrate a, a record peak power for two microns. This was a very high threshold device, and we know why, threading dislocations. There were lots of sites, lost sites in the system. Um, so what we're now looking at is trying to really go beyond this quasi-equilibrium theory into the full non-equilibrium transport uh, to see, in fact, if we can stabilize vexels to output multi, you know, more, well over 10 watts of power, 20, 30 watts of power, single wavelength, and also try to produce very, very short mode lock pulses. And let me just um, finish with, there's a list of potential applications here, but I'm, I'm done, folks, so thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. There's plenty of time for questions.